Armando Hasurungan, Biology and Medicine videos, please make sure to subscribe, join the forum and group for the latest videos, please visit Facebook Armando Hasurungan, please like, and here you can also ask questions, answer questions, and post some interesting things, including your hours. You can also change the quality settings to the highest one for better graphics. In this video, we're going to look at diuretics. Diuretics works on the kidneys, the nephrons of the kidneys. What are diuretics? Well, diuretics are substances that help the body get rid of sodium and water. Diuretics decreases blood pressure because a decrease in plasma volume, a decrease in water, equals a decrease in blood pressure. Hopefully the function of diuretics will make sense towards the end of this video. In this video we're going to look at four main types of diuretics and another additional one. We will look at osmotic diuretics, loop diuretics, thiazide diuretics, and potassium-sparing diuretics, and also the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. All these diuretics aim to reduce blood pressure by increasing the secre excretion of water and sodium in urine. Because diuretics elicit its function on the nephron of the kidneys, let us again recap the structure of the nephron and later see where these diuretics uh, specifically um, has its function along the nephron tubule. So here we have the glomerulus with the afferent arterial coming in and the efferent arterial coming out. Here we have the proximal convoluted tubules, the thick descending limb, the loop of Henle, the thick ascending limb, the distal convoluted tubules, and the collecting duct. Now let us look where along this tubule of the nephron, sodium and other substances can be reabsorbed from. So for example, the main site of sodium reabsorption is in the proximal convoluted tubules, where it absorbs approximately 65-70%. to 70%. Sodium bicarbonate can also be absorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules. Water is reabsorbed within the um, descending limb. And in the thick ascending limb, we have a transporter, a symptomer, which reabsorbs sodium, potassium, and chloride. About 25% of sodium is reabsorbed here. And then we have in the distal convoluted tubules, another symptomer, transporter, which reabsorbs sodium and chloride ions. About 5% of sodium is reabsorbed. And finally, in the collecting ducts, we have a final transporter, <coughs> which is a... which reabsorbs sodium but secretes uh, potassium and this uh, this only reabsorbs about one percent of sodium so not that much water can also be reabsorbed within the collecting duct now what is very important to realize is that wherever along this tubule sodium is reabsorbed this will cause water to be reabsorbed as well somewhere because the golden rule of the kidneys is that water tends to follow sodium. And therefore, when we reabsorb water and sodium, this will indefinitely increase blood pressure. Diuretics prevents the reabsorption of the sodium and water somewhere along this tubule and therefore aims to decrease blood pressure. So now let's look at a scenario where we have an increase in blood pressure and see how diuretics work to decrease blood pressure. The first type of diuretics we'll talk about is osmotic diuretics and they work in the proximal convoluted tubules and also the loop of Henle. These are things such as mannitol, urea, glycerin and isosorbide. Now, they don't really sound like one of those drugs because really what, they, what their main function is is that they increase the solute concentration within the tubules and therefore causes water to be retained within the tubules. This is because it follows the osmosis rule where if we have a higher concentration of solutes, within a particular area, more water will tend to go there. So for example, here we have the cells lining the tubule, 
Here we have the tubular lumen, which is inside the nephron, and then we have the blood, which is outside. In the blood, we have like two solutes and two waters, for example. But in the tubular lumen, we have many solutes, these red things, which can be mannitol or urea. And therefore, there will be a lot of water. And therefore, water will not be reabsorbed because it has to follow the osmosis rule. Hence the name osmotic diuretics. Osmotic diuretics prevent the reabsorption of water from the tubule into the blood. And therefore, it will decrease the blood volume or the plasma volume and therefore decrease blood pressure. So osmotic diuretics, when taken orally or intravenously, they will enter the bloodstream and they will be freely filtered at the glomerulus and enter the tubule. Their function is to limit the reabsorption of water in the tubule by increasing the osmolality in the renal tubule. Their overall function is that they, inc they increase the excretion of sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, bicarbonate, and hydrogen phosphate, and water. So the uh, absorption and elimination of these osmotic diuretics, well, for the absorption, mannitol and urea are given intravenously. Glycerin and isosorbide are administered orally. Um, and so you'd, be, you'd expect if they're given IV, that's a quick response. Elimination, they have a short duration of activity and are quickly metabolized and they're uh, eliminated or excreted through the urine. The next type of diuretics we will look at are the loop diuretics. And as a, as a name might suggest, it works at the loop of Henle. Particularly, it works at the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. These are the drugs such as furosemide and bumetanide. Easy way is mide and nide. Loop diuretics works on the symptoma on the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle and thus prevent the sodium reabsorption. Let's have a closer look. Here we have the blood and the tubule lumen. The tubule lumen is inside the nephron. Here we have the transporter which is within the tubular within a tubular of the lumen. So this transporter typically transports sodium, two chloride ions, and one potassium through. Loop diuretics prevents this chloride or inhibits this chloride from being reabsorbed and thus will basically screw up the transporter and not cause the other ions to be reabsorbed. In the long term, Loop diuretics will also prevent the reabsorption of calcium and magnesium ions. So, loop diuretics prevents essentially the reabsorption of uh, sodium, which therefore prevents the reabsorption of water, which therefore will decrease blood pressure. Some information. So, loop diuretics will essentially increase the urine flow because or because it will prevent the reabsorption of all these things. It increases um, sodium, chloride, potassium, water, calcium, magnesium excretion in the nephron. And because it increases the excretion of these substances, it will therefore decrease the plasma volume, right? And thus, loop diuretics can actually induce renin release due to the plasma vol volume depletion. And renin, as you know, will want to increase blood pressure. For the absorption and elimination of loop diuretics, about 60-90% to is absorbed when given orally. And the elimination is that it's secreted via the proximal tubule. So let's look at now the third diuretic, which is the thiazide diuretics. And these work on the distal convoluted tubules, particularly the transporter here, the symptom of sodium and chloride. Thiazide diuretics include names such as hydrochlorothiazide and chlorothiazide. It's very easy to remember this because they all end in thiazide. So let's look at how it works. 
So here we have the cell, here we have the blood on the outside and the tubular lumen within the inside. Thiazides essentially prevent sodium reabsorption by inhibiting this transporter of sodium and chloride. In the long term, it will actually inhibit the secretion of calcium from the blood to the lumen, but it will promote the secretion of magnesium. So thiazide diuretics, um, of course, increases the sodium excretion up to 5% of the filtered load, 5% because this, this transporter only roughly reabsorbs 5%. Thiazide diuretics increases excretion, essentially, of sodium, chloride, potassium, and water. It, in the long term, it will decrease the secretion of calcium, but increase the secretion of magnesium. Very interestingly enough, thiazide diuretics increases the reabsorption, not the excretion, but the reabsorption of urea in the proximal convoluted tubules. If we increase the reabsorption of urea, this will increase plasma uric acid levels. And then if we have increased plasma uric acid levels, this might lead to gout, gouty arthritis, where it will accumulate within the joints and cause pain, etc. The fourth major type of diuretics are the potassium-sparing diuretics. And there are two classes of these, you can say. And these work in the distal convoluted tubules, the very end of it, and as well as the collecting ducts. Their major goal is to decrease the reabsorption of sodium, but also prevent the excretion of potassium, hence the name potassium-sparing diuretics. Because if you haven't realized, the other diuretics we looked at, the other three, they cause an increase, increase in excretion of potassium. And that is why potassium-sparing diuretics is used in conjunction with other diuretics to prevent the excretion of potassium. Because sometimes potassium is very important in the body. Actually, potassium is important in the body. So remember, there are two types of potassium-sparing diuretics. Let's look at the first one. These are the one, These are things such as amyloride and triamitrine. And they work on the principal cells of the collecting ducts and the late distal convoluted tubules. Normally, let's look at what happens normally. Normally, sodium is reabsorbed from the lumen of the nephron. And then sodium will then be reabsorbed into the blood through a transporter. This transporter, when it reabsorbs sodium, it excretes potassium. Potassium is then excreted into the tubular lumen. The potassium-sparing diuretics, amyloride and triametrine, essentially inhibits this sodium reabsorption, and thus inhibits sodium reabsorption, and as, as well as inhibit uh, potassium excretion. The other type of potassium-sparing diuretics essentially are aldosterone inhibitors, such as spironolactone. And these work on the transporter within the collecting ducts. They work on the intercalated cells where this transporter is located. So what happens is, normally, again, here we have the tubular lumen, intercalated cells, and the blood. Within the blood, we have the hormone aldosterone, which is secreted by the adrenal glands, the cortex of the adrenal glands. Within the intercalated cells, we have the aldosterone receptor. Aldosterone is a steroid, so thus it will bind to the receptor within, inside the cell. The receptor will bring the aldosterone into the nucleus, where it will cause the DNA to make mRNA for potassium and sodium pumps. So here we have a sodium and potassium pump. This will go onto uh, the surface of the cell next to the blood and will cause the reabsorption of sodium as well as the excretion of potassium. What aldosterone inhibitors do, such as spironolactone, is that they inhibit this binding of 
aldosterone with the aldosterone receptor or inhibits just the formation and thus inhibit the production of the sodium potassium pup thus prevent the excretion of potassium as well as the reabsorption of sodium so overall these potassium sparing diuretics they increase the excretion of sodium chloride and water and therefore decrease blood pressure the absorption and elimination of potassium sparing diuretics well the absorption for spironolactone is that they are metabolized by the liver and they're actually highly protein bound meaning that they travel within the blood by binding onto a protein some kind of protein elimination is that they are secreted via the proximal convoluted tubules Finally, there's another type of diuretic, which is essentially the weakest diuretic, and these are the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. And they work at the proximal convoluted tubules, and they prevent the reabsorption of sodium bicarbonate. As I mentioned, they are the weakest diuretics, and they are used to treat glycoma, for example. How they work is that they essentially um, prevent the reabsorption of sodium bicarbonate, which means that it will, it will cause less sodium to be reabsorbed and therefore decrease blood pressure. So I hope you enjoyed this video on diuretics. We learned that diuretics essentially work to decrease blood pressure and therefore they can be used um, in cardiovascular to treat cardiovascular diseases where we see most often an increase in blood pressure. Thank you for watching. Bye.